Okay, so in this first video, we're picking up with negative feedback regulation. And we've already discussed the hormones produced by an endocrine gland. <clears throat> it travels in the bloodstream, and then it's going to cause some event at a target cell. And this is where we're going to pick up. So this event that occurs, we can reference this as an effector or effectors will produce some sort of effect. And there's a variety of different types of effects that can be produced by this hormone, the effector, on that target cell. It could be a new molecule that's going to be generated uh, and released into the bloodstream or someplace else within an organ or tissue. Or we could have uh, some sort of pressure change, maybe pressure change in the blood. Maybe we're trying to regulate body temperature, so it would be a thermal change. And there's many, many others here. We could add many others into this list. In the specific case of our negative feedback regulation loop here with insulin and the pancreas, the pancreas releases insulin into the bloodstream and it travels absolutely everywhere, but one of the locations is going to be the liver. And the liver is going to interact with that insulin through the insulin receptor. And the effect that we're going to see is production of a new protein called GLUT4. GLUT4, GLUT4, G-L-U-T-4, stands for glucose transporter 4. It's going to move up to the membrane, and it's going to interact and pick up the glucose that's circulating in the bloodstream. Now, as this happens, whether it's a new molecule in the bloodstream being produced or a pressure change or a thermal change, or in the case of insulin, glucose being removed from the bloodstream, that event, the effects of that event, are going to be sensed by the organism. Now, <clears throat> that event is going to have information. It's going to have a set of data. So that information or that data is going to be processed and it is going to be evaluated. Now, in the case of the specific case of glucose, we're going to detect glucose levels within the pancreas. The blood flowing through the pancreas is going to have a certain amount of blood glucose uh, circulating through and it's going to process that information about blood glucose and evaluate it. And one of the evaluation steps is to compare those levels to the expected limits. And based off of this evaluation and this comparison, there really can be three outcomes. The comparison could indicate that we are above the tolerance limit, so we're outside of the homeostatic limit. It could evaluate and recognize that we are at the set point, so we are at the average of the homeostatic limit or range, or we could be below. So in the case of blood glucose, 80 milligrams up to 120 milligrams per deciliter would be the expected limit. Blood pressure, 110 over 70. Thermal, uh, thermal um, uh, blood, thermal levels in the blood, the body temperature would be about 37 degrees centigrade. And so all of these are going to be evaluated for different physiological endocrine processes. Now, based off of each of these areas, whether we're above, at the set point, or below, we're going to have some sort of corrective action. So a corrective action is going to be initiated. If we're above, let's say, too high of glucose, then more insulin is going to be produced. If we're below, then we're actually going to remove the insulin secretion and increase glucagon, which undoes the effects of insulin. If we are at the set point, we're going to maintain that situation as best as we can through a hormone called somatostat. 
So this corrective action is going to be initiated, <clears throat> and it may result in another endocrine gland or another hormone within an endocrine gland being produced to help adjust hormone production and release. So if we don't know, if we no longer need insulin, we're going to have this negative feedback back on the cells that are producing the insulin, and those cells are going to be downregulated on the production of insulin. So the final thing that I'm going to talk about here in endocrinology is to break down the hypothalamus and the pituitary because they're considered sort of the master glands. Even though they're not really the master glands, they help to regulate several of the other endocrine glands that we find in human physiology. And we'll finish off with a specific example just to illustrate how the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland work together to affect the functions of other glands in humans to result in a change in physiology. So the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, as you are aware, the hypothalamus and the pituitary are located near the base of the brain. The hypothalamus and the pituitary have a very unique circulatory structure, and that's what I'm illustrating in this figure here. The red is blood supply, and these are a couple capillary beds. Each of these individual dots here are just representations of the different types of cells that are present in the pituitary, and then the neurological type cells that are present in the hypothalamus. So we actually have this very close contextual um, grouping of cells between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. They interact through the bloodstream, through this unique circulatory circuit, so that they can function in a syncytium or function together. So let's start out with a little bit more detail on the hypothalamus. Okay, so the hypothalamus, again, this is at the base of the brain. And literally, hypothalamus means just below the thalamus. And the thalamus would be the part of the brain that is just right here below what's called the third ventricle. There's an open space in the brain. The th thalamus is the bottom or the floor of that open space called the third ventricle. And then right below that is this neurological tissue that's very endocrine driven called the hypothalamus. Now, this is a, a pretty important part of the uh, endocrine system because it's the only point of neural connection. And in fact, the hypothalamus, as you can tell in this figure, consists of neurons. That's neurological tissue. And so we actually here in the hypothalamus have a neural connection to the endocrine system. And so as we're sensing and regulating changes in human biology, the hypothalamus is receiving inputs from these nervous sensors. So the nervous sensors are collecting information about the internal and external environment. We might be detecting sounds from outside coming into and contacting the human body. We might be uh, picking up information on the light that's around, the temperature of the uh, air in the room, but also looking at pressure of the blood, temperature of the blood, the chemistry of the blood, looking at urine production uh, in the kidneys. So there's all kinds of information about both the internal and external environments that are feeding neurologically through sensors back into the hypothalamus. Now, the hypothalamus consists of neurons that can produce what are known as releasing G 
releasing or inhibiting substances. So these are two different types of, uh, of substances. So a releasing or inhibiting hormone. In other words, some hormones are going to be releasing hormones produced by the hypothalamus, and some will be inhibiting hormones produced by the hypothalamus. These releasing hormones and inhibiting hormones are going to control the function of the pituitary gland. And there is a variety of releasing and inhibiting hormones that enter into the circulation of the uh, hypothalamus or directly contact the uh, pituitary through um, neurons, especially the posterior portion of the pituitary. And as those hormones are pr produced and released into the capillaries of the pituitary gland, they're going to begin to interact with the cells of the pituitary gland. They're going to begin to change the physiological function of those cells in the pituitary gland. Okay, so the pituitary gland, there is actually a physical attachment. It's known as the pituitary stalk or the infundibulum. And this connects the pituitary gland directly to the hypothalamus. And it really is a tissue pathway for neurons and blood vessel, blood supply, to interact between the two different glands. And again, it's just simply, I'm just going to simply refer to it as the stalk or the infundibulum. Now, once we get into the pituitary, as you can see here, there's two different looking lobes. Most frequently, these are going to just simply re be referred to as parts. So we have two parts or two lobes of the pituitary gland. And what we are going to use here to name them is just simple location. This is towards the front of the head or the face, and this would be towards the back uh, of the head or the base of the, the back of the brain. So this is going to be anterior. This is going to be posterior. So we refer to that more front part or lobe as the anterior lobe. And then the more posterior, just simply the posterior lobe. Now the posterior lobe and the anterior lobe, they're actually going to generate hormones in different ways. The posterior lobe, this lobe here, is actually going to not produce any hormones at all. There are neurons that connect from the hypothalamus. The hormones are produced in the hypothalamus, get transported into the posterior lobe, and then are released into the surrounding circulation. Whereas the anterior lobe actually interacts with the neurons of the hypothalamus. They deposit their releasing or inhibiting substances into the blood supply. That capillary supply feeds into the anterior pituitary. Those hormones interact with those cells of the anterior pituitary to cause those cells to up or down regulate production of their hormones. In each of these individual cells, the different colors represent different hormones that are being produced. So when the hypothalamus interacts with the pituitary gland, the pituitary gland produces and releases what are known as regulating hormones. So remember just back a minute or two ago, the hypothalamus produces releasing or inhibiting hormones. Those releasing or inhibiting hormones are going to interact with the cells of the pituitary gland to cause regulating hormones to be released. These regulating hormones enter the bloodstream, and as you can see at the bottom of this figure, there's a variety of different tissues and endocrine glands that are going to be regulated. The function is going to be regulated for additional hormones to be released to cause physiological change. So I'm going to go through just a quick example of how this all would work for a specific hormone. And the example we're going to use is a physiological process known as milk letdown. Now, milk letdown occurs during nursing of a newborn or of a baby. 
And the whole process basically requires milk to be produced on demand as the baby suckles. So the baby can receive the milk from the mom for nutritional supply. Now we don't want to have milk letdown occurring all of the time. It's an energetically um, uh, costly, costly process. Also, we just don't need to generate milk and excrete milk or let milk down constantly. We only need it on demand when the baby is sucking. So this whole process starts with the interaction between mom and baby. So the baby begins to nurse. And one of the steps in nursing is called latch on. The baby will latch on to mom's nipple. And the suckling process, the suction that's induced by the baby, is going to stimulate receptors that are found in the tissue of the nipple. Now those receptors are sensory receptors and they interact with the brain. So we have a nervous signal, an action potential that's initiated by the suckling baby and will be sent back to the brain. And in particular, we're going back to the hypothalamus. So that action potential that's stimulated or produced by the suckling baby travels along a sensory and spinal nerve. So that spinal nerve picks up the sensation and transmits that information back to the hypothalamus. Once in the hypothalamus, the neuroendocrine cells of the hypothalamus are going to be stimulated or triggered by that nerve signal, the action potential that's just crossed from the nipple back up into the hypothalamus. Now, one of the things and one of the responses to this particular nerve signal coming into the hypothalamus is for the hypothalamus to respond by producing, so we have a change in physiology, and that change in physiology is to produce a hormone called oxytocin. So oxytocin. Now, oxytocin is produced in the hypothalamus, but it is actually going to be released from nerves and enters into the posterior pituitary. So oxytocin is released from nerves of the hypothalamus, those neuroendocrine cells, into the tissue of the posterior pituitary. I'm just going to abbreviate that to post pit. Now, from the posterior pituitary, that hormone oxytocin is going to be released from the cells of the posterior pituitary and then it's going to enter the bloodstream. It enters the bloodstream through the capillary bed that is present in the posterior pituitary. So oxytocin levels are going to begin to increase in the general circulation. And they're going everywhere, circulating absolutely everywhere. One of the places that the oxytocin will end up is in the capillary bed of the mammary tissue.
So oxytocin is released from the posterior pituitary, ends up in the mammary tissue. It also interacts with the uterus, and immediately following birth, suckling of the baby may actually induce additional uterine contraction because oxytocin is also involved in that process, causing the uh, myometrium, the muscle portion of the uterus, to undergo smooth muscle contraction. Uh, but as far as um, the uh, process of milk letdown, oxytocin is going to be interacting with what are called myoepithelial cells. These are muscle-like epithelial cells that we find in the mammary gland that respond to oxytocin by undergoing contraction. Okay, so these myoepithelial gland cells are going to begin to contract and squeeze down on the mammary tissue. We have a second hormone that's also going to be involved in this whole process. And this hormone is a hormone known as prolactin. Prolactin is normally inhibited from the hypothalamus onto the pituitary. So the pituitary gland is what is actually going to release prolactin. The hypothalamus has this constant inhibition that's occurring. The hypothalamus always is releasing this substance, this hormone called prolactin inhibiting factor. So prior to baby latch on and suckling, prolactin inhibiting factor is constantly being produced by the hypothalamus. By the way, another name for prolactin inhibiting factor is dopamine. So prolactin inhibiting factor normally is being released. Now, when suckling begins, we have that interaction, the nervous system interaction with the hypothalamus. Oxytocin is being produced, and prolactin inhibiting factor is stopped. So now we're lifting the inhibition signal on prolactin, and that means that the anterior pituitary is now capable of releasing a hormone called prolactin. So prolactin is released. It also circulates to the mammary tissue. So we've increased levels of oxytocin, and we've increased levels of prolactin in the mammary tissue. That is going to be our target tissue or our target cells. So the target cells are in the mammary tissue. And we are going to begin to release stored milk. Now, in the cells of the mammary tissue, we actually have milk that's contained inside of the cells, contained within a vessel. These hormones work together to release that stored milk from the vesicles in the cells. So we're going to have exocytosis of this thing called milk, this solution called milk, from the cells of the mammary tissue. They are released into an exocrine gland, and in particular into the ductwork of that exocrine gland. So now we're beginning to release this milk solution into the duct of the mammary gland, which is an exocrine gland type structure. We have myoepithelial cells that are squeezing because of the action of oxytocin, which is moving this released milk closer and closer to the opening of the nipple. And as it approaches that, the baby is continuing, continuing to suckle and will begin to use that pressure of suckling to receive the milk that's being produced. So the baby receives the milk via the suckling action. Now this was stored milk. Prolactin as it interacts with the mammary tissue, is actually going to cause more milk 
to be produced. And it's going to replenish the stored milk supply that was decimated as the baby began to suckle and will provide additional milk sustenance to the individual. <clears throat> 